Hello, everyone. Is everyone having a good time? Join the conference so far? Terrific. Um, before we start our next panel, we'd like to share some exciting news with you. Um, for more than seven years, Sandbox has been a catalyst for dialogue and innovation around play and learning. Uh, each year, we select issues that, we've, that uh, we feel speak to important challenges for kids and families, um, and that we believe require diverse perspectives and innovative solutions. Uh, most importantly for us, with our model, we look to tackle these critical issues through partnerships with like-minded organizations that share the same goals and passions, just like MIT, our founding partner, Sandbox. To that end, we are absolutely thrilled to announce a strategic partnership with the President's Council on Fitness, Sports, and Nutrition and the Council's Foundation to host the first of what will be annual conferences that explore innovation and impact for kids and families around the areas of sports, fitness, and health. The first Sandbox Sports, do we have the slide? The first Sandbox Sports Conference um, will actually be a part of this year's 60th anniversary of the President's Council and will take place in Washington, D.C. Um, uh, and um, uh, the President's Council and its foundation have been at the forefront of helping families lead more active lives and it's an absolute honor and privilege for us to be their partner on this, and we're fortunate to have them here with us today. Um, Shelly and Chris, would you like to say a few words? Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Paul and Allison and, and Wendy. Uh, thanks for, uh, for having us here. So President's Council, most of you probably know us as the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports, right? Who knows us by that? And, and how do you know us by that? Flexed arm hang. <laughs> because of the test, right? Most people like to say the test or because of the patch, right? You either got it or you didn't, right? Are you with me? Yes, yes. So for some, that doggone test that you took in, in elementary school or middle school, for some of us that was a motivator, for some of us not so much and have no fear. There'll be a support group meeting immediately following if you need some support because you didn't get the patch. Um, but but <laughs> seriously, we have been, we've been out around for 60 years now, as Paul just said. I'm happy to say we have modified that tired old test, that assessment, to be now much more health related and f we hope fun for kids and motivating um, in a non-competitive way. So we've come a long way in our 60 years, and I would say uh, kind of a pretty long way in the last few years. And part of that uh, certainly is being able to team up with uh, folks at, San at Sandbox. And I'm gonna let uh, Chris talk about a little bit more about that, but we are, uh, I just want you to know that we are so excited um, to, to have this first uh, uh, Sandbox uh, Sports Summit. Uh, my staff, my 23 council members who are former and current professional Olympic athletes, and now that we have nutrition in our name, uh, we have chefs and, and folks like Rachel Ray and, and others. Um, we are just so excited to be continuing our mission, which is to educate, engage, and empower all Americans to lead a healthy lifestyle. So I hope you all will join us um, in October, and I'm gonna let Chris just share a few more thoughts on that as well. Thank you so much. Thank you all. I'm Chris Watts, the Executive Director of the National Foundation on Fitness, Sports, and Nutrition. And as Shelley and Paul mentioned, we're really focusing the 60th anniversary celebration we have this year um, to help us better prepare to solve the big problems that we're facing. And for us, what's more important than health? And I think that's the, that's the big issue with health and fitness of what we're trying to solve this year. And as some of the panelists mentioned earlier, we really used this past year to, to bring us back and identify that why. Why are we going out and doing this and understanding what outcomes we're trying to achieve? And, and, and for us, it was the filling that gap between what people know, which it's incredible, the, 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 the education and information that's out there, that people know that they need to be healthy, but un unfortunately for many folks and some folks that need it the most, what they do is, is, has a lot of opportunity to improve. So this year, we're really focusing on bridging that gap and filling that, 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 that void. 
And so with the Sandbox Summit, we're excited to explore those challenges and opportunities um, with Play Science as a key partner with us on, on, on framing how that could look and through the Sandbox model of bringing really the best of the private sector together um, to expand our thinking. Um, certainly being linked to the government, we want to make sure that we're engaging and, and activating the best that's out there and helping us move closer to where we want to be. And that's healthier, more active, happier, smarter kids. And certainly that includes, as was mentioned earlier by Kelly and Discovery Education, figuring out where health and fitness fits in the STEM education model. What, how do we better prepare students for life? And that's something that we're going to be exploring um, this year and certainly through the Sandbox Summit. So we invite you all to be a part of it. Um, please talk to Shelly or I. Our colleague Ebony is here as well. We'd love to, to tell you more about our plans and see how we can get involved. And stay tuned for some other big announcements from at least us in the next month. We're going to be announcing our, our big plans for the 60th anniversary. So thank you all. All right, now we're going to, without further ado, move on to our panel on um, international engagement. Wherever it's going. Okay. The side of you. Welcome. So um, we have an absolutely fantastic panel here. Um, big brands, small brands, US-based brands, international brands, um, media, technology, consumer products, pure entertainment, edutainment, and, and learning. Um, uh, we're going to be having a PowerPoint-free conversation, so sorry for all the visual learners out there. Um, you know, trying to really talk about um, what works, what doesn't work, um, how do you approach sort of scaling internationally? So look, you know, US-based, depending on who you talk to, there are 50 to 60 million kids, 18 and under. Globally, just under 2 billion, okay? So even from a pure economic point of view, put aside the double bottom line impact, um, if you're a brand that really wants to seek to engage or serve um, families, communities, um, you really need to think globally, and of course, we live in a connected world without borders today. So um, um, I'd like to kind of go through the panel, have all of you introduce yourselves, um, talk about what your companies do, how you sort of play internationally, and that will provide a context for our discussion. So Brad, why don't you kick it off? I'm Brad Dancer, I'm the Executive Vice President of uh, Global Programming Strategy and Research for the National Geographic Channels, um, part of National Geographic Partners, which um, Hopefully many are familiar with was formed last November when uh, Fox uh, invested further in the National Geographic beyond the cable channel, including all the media properties for National Geographic Society. So we're all one big company as of last November. We are in 441 million homes in 171 countries and broadcast in 45 different languages uh, for National Geographic Channel, Nat Geo Wild, uh, Nat Geo Mundo, which is a Spanish language channel here in the US, and Nat Geo People, which is a lifestyle channel available in 30 countries worldwide. Um, so my job is to set out the program strategy for all these um, channels globally. Um, we work out of the DC office. Uh, we work with all the regions, which I'm sure we'll get into later. Uh, <laughs> but we have a big focus of both a very global focus and a very locally fo uh, focus for the amount of, I think we have 30 um, offices uh, across the globe uh, as part of solely National Geographic and or with our partners at Fox. Eddie? Hi, my name's Eddie Geller. I'm the co-founder CEO of a company called Tiny Beans. Originally from Sydney, we were based in Sydney four years ago, and then I moved to New York about 18 months ago. Um, Tiny Beans is really, I guess, in the business of families, or love, I guess, when I do, it's at the tone of, uh, of, it's all about of, love. of, of the, uh, it's all about love. Um, so Tiny Beans really brings families together all over the world to really, you know, celebrate and cherish the moments of their kids every day. So for us, we don't have borders. Obviously, we have a platform for parents and they basically capture these moments of their kids and they share it privately with their families all over the world. As opposed to posting all over social media, it's private. And we really, you know, the, 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 the stories we hear every day from grandparents, I mean, we had a great-grandmother, 96, respond the other day telling me how she, you know, cherishes every day the moments of her great-grandkids every day. So for us, it's all about building these families together and connecting them every day. Um, and it's all about, you know, um, creating these moments, whether it's first steps, first words, et cetera, in a private way, and everyone gets to celebrate these, these moments. 
Hi, I'm Terry Weiss. Um, I'm the head of production and development for a new division within NBC Universal uh, Pictures. Uh, it's the Kids and Family Productions team. Uh, I've been there all of six months. Uh, that's how early and new uh, the group is. Uh, what's interesting about my job is that I'm focused on series, series content and serialized content for TV, but for alternate platforms, over-the-top platforms, um, variety within the kids and family space. Um, and my team actually ladders up to the brand development team, which oversees consumer products and digital gaming, as well as um, franchise marketing. And that team itself ladders up actually to the film division at Universal Pictures. So even though NBC Universal is a TV as well as film uh, media company, uh, I'm situated in the film division there. Uh, and just briefly, uh, prior to the six months that I've been at NBC Universal, I was at Nickelodeon heading up the preschool division uh, there. So that's me in a nutshell. Martin. Hello, uh, I'm Martin Skebel. I'm from Lipa Learning, and uh, we are a pretty young company from like uh, 2012. We are building um, an educational and developmental <laughs> system for preschools and preschoolers. And uh, it's a kind of like 60 of us, and uh, we are based in Prague in Czech Republic. Uh, what we do is um, that we trying to find a balance between a digital and a real world. And um, so not only um, developing our own uh, application, uh, educational application, which we are having uh, 18th now, uh, but also interactive books and the real world activities, uh, tips for parents, uh, et cetera. <coughs> Probably I'll get it later. Thanks. Terrific. Jen? I'm Jen McLean. I'm the president of the Kids and Games Division of Family Education Network. We are best known for FunBrain, which is an educational gaming site, which has been around for 19 years, so roughly <laughs> twice as long as the kids actually using it, <laughs> as well as Pop Tropica, which is one of the best known kids' virtual worlds, again, one of the longtime veterans in the space, um, and originally created by Jeff Kinney, which if any of you have children uh, under the age of 15, you probably know best for Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Um, we were formerly a division of Pearson, and recently spun off and acquired by a, a company named Sandbox, in fact, though not related, um, that it really has a mission of investing in kids' entertainment and education. And for us, in part because we've been around for so long, we're available worldwide. We have users in 162 different countries. And we also have a partnership with Pearson to use the Pop Tropica brand and properties to help teach English as a second language, which has really been both an amazing learning experience and a great opportunity to kind of have the Pop Tropica brand grow and develop, particularly internationally. Okay, terrific. So let's just jump in. So very interested in understanding, I think the audience will be too, in how do you, you know, look, global audiences, so 170 countries, 170 plus countries, Eddie just a week ago, 196 countries, mm -hmm. right, with a, you know, early, you know, so how do you, you know, when you have these global audiences across borders, right, what approaches do you take when you're developing or commissioning, right, content, media, and products, whether it's entertainment or whether it's educational, right, because in a global world, I mean, there are some truisms, but one size doesn't necessarily fit all, right? And there are cultural differences. So Brad, you want to kick that off? Sure. Do um, well, we do a whole lot of things. But one thing is that I'll start with that uh, there isn't anything that for us has ever worked globally in every single market. And I don't imagine there ever will be, at least in the television uh, landscape. But we, we have a wide network of programmers and developers across the globe. So it's hard for us to make a show that will appeal to every country uh, and all the languages we broadcast. But what we want to do is we also don't know in Washington, D.C., um, the local flavors and tastes and everything else that goes on in these markets, so we're not going to make all of our decisions by ourselves. We have a pretty robust um, website that we use internally for all of our development projects, uh, treatments, videos, and everything else. So we get feedback from all of our, our regions. Um, it is not a democracy, however, um, but it is, a, <laughs> it is a way for us to understand what it is about these shows that will work or not work. Um, based on the people in the field. Mm -hmm. um, we use that information then to finally guide, and then, and then we track everything. Um, and we're not, when I talk about television, I talk about television, the broadest concept, not just linear, but, but nonlinear platforms as well. Uh, but it, it's all about 
understanding the individual market and making a decision based on the broader picture. So there are, there are in our world, it's so much ratings based. And um, so we look at the markets that have the most impact for ratings according to revenue. Uh, so if a, not, not, a market doesn't have advertising but has ratings, uh, be honest, unfortunately, we don't look at you as hard as we might look at the UK, which is very much like the US, uh, which is very um, flexible in terms of how it, how it relates to its revenue. Do you commission globally or do you do that more yeah. locally? How do you? We, so two things. We, what do you aspire to do? We commission and own nearly all of our content. So we own all in all media and all perpetuity of the vast majority of the content that we produce in National Geographic and always have. Um, there are acquisitions that are done on a minor amount. And then we also have local productions. So outside of the global programming budget we have, every region um, and, every, and a few select markets have local dollars because some of them need, there's many, many rights that I don't want to get into in the broadcast media, but some markets um, have particular regions that I have to have a certain percentage of content produced in this country or focus on this country. Um, and then, but that also gives an opportunity for a local production. If it's good and it's done really well, um, then it can transport to the rest of the world. We just did that with a production right. in LATAM. Um, they're producing a show at an airport in Columbia. It's been doing so well for them. We started translating other languages. And <laughs> sure enough, uh, airport security Columbia is now a, a global worldwide hit for National right. Geographic Town. <laughs> Excellent. So Eddie, you are tiny beans has users in 196 countries. I remember mm. talking with you saying you had to look some of them up. Mm. Um, and uh, so that's where you are now, past a million users and looking to kind of keep that up. Um, how do you view product and platform development when you're in all of those countries, right? Do you sort of you know, focus on the ones where you have, you know, do you focus on the ones where you have the, you know, the largest and the strongest presence? Or do you ever consider actually going into some of the smaller ones in the emerging markets and looking to own and dominate those? And Sesame has actually been really successful in kind of looking at doing that, right? They have the number one channel in certain countries in Eastern Europe, for example, so they're not going head to head. How do you, how do you guys think about that? Sure. Um, we definitely try and think about it more abstractively. So how do we onboard the perfect user? So how do we find the perfect user? How do we onboard them wherever they are? And, and, and try and engage them across, you know, um, if they're, you know, in Idaho or if they're in, you know, Indonesia. And for us, the perfect user, they, they sign up and they start setting up their family, start setting up their kids and adding the moments. And if, if we get those three things, they're the perfect user and we'll, we'll usually retain them forever. But if they don't, you know, obviously get those three things, it's very hard to. And we found actually, um, it's a great story actually, I can't remember to share, in um, that last year, I worked with Google and they, and they, um, appreciatively um, uh, featured our app. So thank you, Google, in November for best, um, best apps and new and improved apps. And what we found, we had great growth in all these you know, um, countries all over the world of new people signing up. But we found that their parents were signing up, but they weren't inviting their families to it. And we figured, well, why is it? Like, why is it those countries that are, you know, obviously the users in those countries finding it harder to sign up as opposed to, you know, obviously the countries we're in, like Australia, US, UK. And we did a whole bunch of brainstorming. And actually, our design team came up and they drew a uh, cartoon grandparent, grandmother. Um, and they, they did a test of this floating grandmother and who pointed to the button you had to press to uh, invite families to it. And uh, we tried lots of different things, but this is the one that, that, that you know, was the most wackiest. And um, basically, we got to double the conversion literally overnight wow. of this floating grandmother as part of the onboarding that pointed to the button that we thought would be pretty obvious to press anyway, um, but that's what connected their visual experience to understanding, signing up, and also adding a family member. Um, so again, it's using design and creativity in a way in which right. you, know, you can appeal to people in all over the world. And you used an animation instead of an actual exactly. footage shot, mm -hmm. thinking, that, that anyone thinking, can that, relate thinking to. that grandmothers around the world aren't all gonna look the exactly. same. So, well, I mean, but that's, that's mm. really smart thinking. Yeah. Terry, I mean, you know, Universal, NBC Universal, you have an incredible library. Um, you know, how do you sort of look to kind of mine that library, create new IP, being the, you know, being the global company that you are? How do you sort of figure out where to start and where to go? Yeah, well, I, it's absolutely true. We're, you know, we are, you know, part of what my starting line is, is to kind of look at the franchises that exist within the NBC Universal library and, <clears throat> and evaluate, like, are there some that have a broader kind of kid potential with them? Um, are there things that we can mine from the library of NBC Universal 
um, that maybe kind of we could reimagine in some way um, that would resonate with today's kids. But I, I do think that regardless of you know, what direction we go to, either with uh, something that's in the current library or something that we're thinking about, like kind of in the archives of NBC Universal, is researching it with kids um, and parents um, in localized uh, areas to just get a sense. I mean, I think that, you know, we just recently did um, a five country research on one of our franchises just to see if the DNA that really we feel is core to the property is what we're hearing back from our audiences in different regions. So, uh, you know, what we hear in London versus what we hear in Mexico City versus, you know, what we might hear in Sydney versus what we hear in the US, you know, kind of evaluating like how, you know, what kids are saying matters to them the most. And I think that that will continue to be our foundation, I think is continuing to do research, not just in the US, of course, but globally. Um, and I think that it will eventually broaden into emerging markets as well to kind of get a sense of, you know, what do, what do, what's working, what are we missing, what, what seems to be a particular interest um, that might be surprising or unexpected that we can kind of mm -hmm. think about when we do new material. Terrific. So Martin, you're a great example. 16 apps on this terrific learning platform. And now, you're international and you're sort of looking to sort of say, hey, one of the things you're, uh, you know, is, is how do we move to the U.S., right? Where a lot of companies are in the U.S. and they start here. Um, and then in many instances, international is an afterthought, right? So um, tell us about, you know, how you view international and how that sort of flows into your team's thinking strategically around developing the platform, the content, the different types of apps. Um, from the fun and the curriculum too. It's incredibly interesting. Well, thank you, but I guess that we are still at the beginning. And actually, uh, <laughs> um, although we have like these uh, 17 or 18 apps um, online on uh, four app stores, um, it's the way that uh, when we create the educational app, we um, uh, give it to the app store, but actually we don't do any marketing yet until now. So um, actually we put it there and uh, like, have it uh, living there. Um, we reach kind of like uh, 200 countries with it, and we have uh, around like um, a half a million downloads without marketing. But what we do is actually uh, that we, we, we uh, all our team was like really like focused, like we want to market, we want to market, we want to market. But like uh, we have um, kind of very different owner. And um, he always says, hold on, hold on, hold on, <laughs> focus on the product, focus on the product, focus on the product. And even though we've been featured, for instance, like in 27 countries on app stores, uh, actually he said, like, it's nice that we are 27 countries featured, but uh, focus that you are <laughs> mainly featured by me. <laughs> so focus on the product, focus on the product, focus on the product, hold on. So well, actually, you know, I know a lot of entrepreneurs who would love to have VC and private equity backers <laughs> that were as enlightened as that, right? So it's not always the case, right? But yeah, it's not. <laughs> so um, we are focusing on the product, and actually uh, now we are ready to do the marketing because we finished our eight curriculas and uh, the basics and, and the whole uh, design of the curriculas. And uh, also, we are finishing the one application, the Umbrella application, which will actually cover all of our products. But still, we are at the beginning. And uh, how we reach the worldwide is actually uh, starting with the product. So uh, also, uh, we are focusing on the localizing all of our apps. Uh, now we are in 10 languages. Uh, by the end of the year, I'd like uh, us to be in 26 languages, uh, all, nice. not only in the, in the games, in text, but also with all uh, voiceovers and uh, all uh, inter um, interactive books uh, and all the other sub-products which also would be the real-world activities and so on, as I mentioned, the balance between the digital and real-world. Right. That's strongly international. Jen? So for us, one of our uh, best tools in expanding internationally has been a partnership with Pearson. Um, so Pearson, obviously, is a global textbook company, and they have an English as a second language product that they take to non-English speaking countries. They license the Pop Tropica brand, so you can buy Pop Tropica textbooks. And we see our app, especially on mobile devices, on phones and tablets, as kind of a, a natural way for kids to take what they are experiencing in the classroom and then have fun with it. And that fun is, to us, the most important thing that we bring to the experience. We are not experts on writing textbooks for English as a second language, 
But what we do really, really well is create story-driven kids' experiences that put kids in the, in the role of the hero. And to us and to Pearson, it makes a ton of sense to really focus on um, how kids can have fun engaging with what they're learning outside of the classroom, how kids can be the hero, how kids can tell the story. Now, in terms of actually delivering that, and we, we see a lot of the standard pitfalls that you normally do. Localization is a challenge. Um, you know, we, we learned the hard way to make sure that we build uh, text input about twice what you think you need. Thank you, German. Um, but you know, for, for us, it's not just localization in terms of language, it's also culturalization. And again, that's where we, very similar to, to Brad, we lean on local experts wherever possible because there are just things that you cannot assume are consistent or are relevant or interesting or not offensive. And we really need that local expertise. And do you have that local expertise specifically in I mean, is that through Pearson? Is that through an advisory network um, that you're building that's sort of somewhat informal? How do you go about doing that with maximum impact, but you know, and high ROI, but modest cost outlay? Yeah, that's, a, that's something a that I think every entrepreneurial company struggles <laughs> with. And you know, first of all, we are fortunate in that we make games for kids. And so usually when you ask someone if they'd like to give you input on a game for a kid, they get super, super excited. <laughs> and we shamelessly take advantage of that, frankly. Um, you know, we do lean on, on Pearson. We also are fortunate to have um, some global investors, and we lean on their companies. We work with a number of companies internationally to help give us that insight. And you know, we, we have a wonderful cross-cultural um, executive board that also gives us significant insight there. Right, so you've structured yourself exactly. to sort of be successful, right? Um, can you talk a little bit more because, um, well, we're gonna come back to the point about partnerships, but, but we've hit upon investors right now. So um, Sandbox & Co. Um, is based in the UK, and one of their value adds, as they say, is that they, one of their investment criteria, if I understand this correctly, is that they lo are looking for companies that want to go international. And if you don't want to go international, then you, you know, they're not the ones for you. And yes, they're smart money, right? And, and they have expertise in kids and learning, right? How important, how helpful has that been so far in the first four or five months of you coming in to sort of just say, well, let's kind of move the ship in the right direction? Right. So full disclosure, I've been with uh, Family Education Network for almost six months as well. Um, and for me, one of the things that was really exciting is the idea that we, that Sandbox embraces and in fact a mandate that right. we live in a global community. And so every product we do has to be a global product has to be built from the ground up for a global audience. Now, sometimes that means tech choices, like, for example, the, the larger text input that I mentioned. But it also means being sensitive to assumptions that we often make. So for example, if we were building a back-to-school island in Pop Tropica, it would not take place in the fall. Because for half of the world, they don't start school in the fall. And that <laughs> sounds like something that is pretty obvious, but actually is is something that often um, someone who hasn't traveled outside of the United right. States might not realize. And so we try to build in from the ground up the idea that you have to leave all of your assumptions at the door. And in terms of that, that value add attitude, you know, I, I think we're actually fortunate because um, when I came in, I said, look, we are absolutely taking uh, the, the new product that we're working on global, but we have to get the product great first because we don't want to have a miss and then have to go back to, for example, our, our telco partners in Malaysia and say, no, 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 it's really right this time. We don't want to have to go back to Google and say, yeah, I know it wasn't very good the first time, but now you can take a chance on us. And so for us, it is at its core, get the product right first, then lean on your network of partnerships to localize, mm -hmm. then start using your distribution networks and, and particularly the value that Sandbox & Co. brings to take this, this, great, this great product that you love and that kids love worldwide. Got it. So um, throwing this question out to everyone, um, so what is the role, if there is any, um, of insights and research um, and the process in terms of uh, developing content, themes, brands, 
um, and products and services. Um, obviously, at Play Science, it's one of the core three things we do. So we have a very strong point of view on this. But um, we are continually surprised that we've seen brands, big and small, global, multi-billion to startups that think A-B testing is just the way to go. And they don't really necessarily sort of take the effort to kind of you know, find people. Um, but every organization, different groups with organizations you know, approach this differently. I'm just throwing this out there. I'm just curious as to you know, um, how that's approached, big company, small company, and what works and what, and what doesn't work, and what, you know, how have things sort of changed? Um, uh, I, I can take right? part of it simply okay. because um, part of my job is research. So <laughs> I like to think that uh, it's the most important thing that we do uh, every, every, in, in, the, in the entire business, but uh, not everybody buys that. Um, so, so I'll talk about it from a global standpoint. Um, research is actually, at the end of the day, we make television programming for multi-platforms with the idea that people are going to watch it. Um, so that if people are going to watch it, I need to know who those people are and what they're thinking as best I can. Otherwise, um, it, the job needs to get that much more difficult. Um, but we're not here to predict the future per se or decide what the next show should be, but understand where um, people's attitudes and behaviors are going so that the creative group can use that information to be creative. It's not prescriptive, it's part of a mm -hmm. toolkit. Um, but globally is hard, uh, and one of the things we've, we've and this is probably somewhat specific to National Geographic. Um, our brand isn't an issue. Everybody knows the National Geographic brand. It might mean different things in different countries. Some countries, actually, the channel, that's the biggest part of the brand because the magazine hasn't been there except for maybe the last couple of years. In the US, obviously, this is a 128-year-old institution. So anyway, it's, um, it, so getting through that, but wherever where it means, it means quality. So then we have to get past that. And so surveys are a problem for us. Ethnography studies, in-home studies, so much more impactful, especially because I'm worried about getting my, my creative group the right information to help them make better shows. Uh, a survey of X percent of people say this isn't going to help them for that regard, but how they use the media in their, in their house is much more impactful. And is that centralized, or do, you know, does that roll up to one person, or is that sort of si sort of siloed in different? We parts have of the uh, a global research group that that rolls up into me. That's a very small group of people. There's only four, and then there's 27 odd researchers based in all the different regions. Yeah. Got it. Um, yeah. Other people on the panel. The role yeah. of insights and research. I mean, I'll say what's interesting about kind of es establishing a kids group within. Uh, a larger company that's been primarily focused on adults. I think right. one of the biggest th topics of conversation is why research is so important, particularly in the kids space, because um, you know it's it's very easy to forget how young four is or how young even seven is. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just like you know you can start to think that seven, eight, nine, oh, that's a big kid. And then you go into a research room and you see a seven-year-old and you see they're still kind of young and little and, mm -hmm. and innocent in those early elementary years. And, and you know, even once you, even if you have children or you have nep nieces and nephews or you have people in your life that are very close to you that have kids, as soon as those kids get out of the demographic that you're focusing on, mm -hmm. it's very easy to forget. Um, kind of where they're at, what's important to them, what stories feel relevant, um, you know. Uh, and so it's so important when you're making kids content, if you're an adult, to kind of go back to your audience at different checkpoints to make sure that the stories you're telling they actually care about. Um, you know, that the, if there's content and the, if there's curriculum in there that you're leveling it at the right place for them. Because um, if you just presume that you've remembered or if the story feels really funny to you, um, it may not necessarily feel funny to um, the audience that you're actually right. targeting it. And so I think that that is really interesting. And, and you know, it sounds very obvious, but you, know, you, you would be surprised when you kind of have a conversation with somebody who's pr been primarily creating content for adult audiences, mm -hmm. where they go, wow, that's a really interesting. You know, you, you forget how little three is right. unless you're living with someone who's three or has somebody who's three in your life. I can see that. So um, last topic, I think, um, the role of partnerships, right? Mm -hmm. So we love the saying, you know, the old African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go with others, right? And that's part of our ethos, right? Um, especially for the smaller brands here, you know, um, uh, how important are partnerships for you in terms of building the business and engaging audiences? Eddie, you want to 
Sure. Talk about that a little. Um, look, they're crucial. I mean, partnerships really, I think, is, is a key ingredient towards a startup's growth and success because it not only brings, obviously, credibility, but it brings channel and distribution and, and validity to what you're trying to do. And obviously, a startup can move much, much faster um, than probably what you know, corporate can, although corporates these days are moving faster and creating their own startups within their own you know, businesses. So, so but, start, but, but, but I mean, for, for, for us, I mean, I, I'm very focused on partnerships. And really, whenever we do partnerships with brands, it's always about, you know, how can we grow their business? How can, you know, how can we grow ours? There's always, always win-win. And, and the only thing for me is, like, how do we do it quickly? Because, you know, startups <laughs> don't have much time and corporates mostly do. Right. Um, right. And they're really running at their pace right. and you need to run at your pace. Um, and sometimes it doesn't work out for that reason. So you need to have timing, the right people, alignment, the right goals. And we've had a couple of situations where everything was aligned, but they treated us like a startup as opposed to a partner. And you know, and we didn't want to be a startup, we wanted to be a partner. So it's about trying to find the right companies who get culturally, you, you culturally, um, basically the goals are aligned and um, you both believe in what you're trying to do together. But yeah, it's crucial for us. So can you give, a, um, can you give an example of a partnership that went well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so, so many years ago, uh, we formed a partnership with an in-hospital photography company. I mean, we found that our acquisition really strategy needed to be with new parents. So how do you get to new parents? Really, there's many avenues, but a key one is obviously the hospital bed. Um, so, uh, so uh, That's we, new. <laughs> right, that's... <laughs> Um, it didn't come from this industry, right? Um, so so uh, we formed a partnership with a company and they took the photos of the babies um, of, of, of half the hospital groups in the US actually and they had contracts with hospitals and they, and they basically commercially sell these photos to parents and basically the partnership was whenever they took photos of these kids they invited them all to join Tiny Beans. Um, but it took three months of testing, nine months of negotiations and then it went south several times for us to form the mm -hmm. partnership that is still in place today. Got it. Excellent. Martin? Well, actually, uh, this is one of the most, uh, um, the biggest reason why we are here, also to find partnerships. And uh, actually, this Hear is... Hear that, uh, everybody? <laughs> <laughs> and actually, um, we want to use uh, this uh, year of uh, Fire Monkey and 2016 for these uh, partnerships and also uh, to find um, strategic partners in, uh, in our uh, field. Um, it was because we were like um, on hold with the product, but now it's uh, kind of like real breaking point and uh, we are going on. Uh, we have well, lots of partners, but uh, we were, haven't been focusing on that uh, field that much as, as we are now. So uh, this is actually our kind of like year of roadshow, so that, that's why we are oh, uh, scrolling around the world, uh, <laughs> around uh, the, the conferences and find the best people because only the best people can do this kind of great cause. And actually, uh, it is about people and uh, about to kind of like unite uh, with, a, uh, with this great cause. Terrific. Do we have time for one or two quick questions? Sure. Any questions from the audience? From the trenches here, these guys are living it day in and day out. I think someone in the back. So um, as a researcher myself, I feel like I always come up with a ton of information and a ton of knowledge about consumers. And as you also mentioned, there's the timeline and the constant crunch. I'm wondering how you find that balance between implementing what you learn about the international markets you're working in with the realities of just needing to deliver something or get something out there. Uh, from our end, um, <laughs> Uh, you might not like this answer, but um, it's it's we're only as good as the last study. Uh, so every, you know, television, everything moves so fast. Um, you know, we've had to shrink the amount of time we do <coughs> research, or the same amount of time we can analyze the research, um, because by the time we've amassed the information and gone through everything, uh, it's next show, next product, next quarter, whatever it might be. Uh, so it, it's it's a matter of we we use as many people as we can, because like I said, we have a big network of, of researchers, so we kind of spread the wealth, but um, uh, we are, uh, and this is maybe not the way researchers want to hear so how we do some things, but we're so. Give it uh, to them straight. Yeah, hey, it's good, you know, we're just so, we're, we're so mad dash with things that it's, what are the key things we learned out of that? Great, let's, let's put it to the next project, and then we're, we're on to the next project. Uh, and we keep iterating over what we've learned, so we're not making the same mistakes, hopefully, although we always do that sometimes, but. Um, but we, we don't spend a lot of time on studies. We just, we, we, we can't afford to. 
in just the startup's perspective, um, uh, just basically look to fail every day. So learn what you learned yesterday, try and apply it to what you're doing today and release it and the whole fail fast. Big believers in the whole lean startup but about you know testing lots and lots of different things, learning from it and trying again the next day and it's good like you know and, and the, the goal is to learn. Like that's really that's really the key. one out of every ten TV shows works. <laughs> so failure in TV is a we don't even it's like yeah that's the business. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sorry. Hi, uh, Denise Taylor with Privo. I think this is a great session. Um, international you. new law just uh, agreed to GDPR that's going to affect everybody in the room and they bumped the age for protection of kids or the need for parental consent to 15 and under as a default and member states can can uh, can adjust H how do you think that's going to affect your businesses if you are um, dealing with some of the older children with your products and services now dealing with not just u.s law but european that's a great question denise Actually, we have a, an app that we're in the middle of developing, and um, one of the things that we did is we, we had the general, you know, what's your age, 13 plus, and we changed that to 16 plus, uh, and stuff like that, so making sure that you are constantly aware of what's going on with the legislation, partnering with companies, whether Prevo or, or KidSafe, to make sure that you have an external third party whose goals are really making sure that you are compliant with the global regulations yeah. as opposed to US regulations. And honestly, who, who don't have your KPIs and your revenue per user at heart, but have doing the right thing by the kids. Because I think it is important to have that independent expert voice who can come in and say, you need to be aware of X, you need to be sure that your products are changing, and you need to be cognizant of the reasons why these laws were passed so that you are doing the right thing for the kids who are engaging with your product. That's a great point. Okay, I think we're done. Thank you. Thank all of you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you.